welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of Lectures on Ancient Philosophy Written by Manly P. Hall Chapter 6 The Disciplines of Salvation Assuming realization to be the product of definite philosophic disciplines, we now turn to a consideration of the sciences and procedures which are most valuable in the unfoldment of the rational intellect and the directionalization of the conscious knower. Initiated into the mysteries of contemplative philosophy by the Brahman initiates of Elora and Elephanta, Pythagoras set forth three disciplines as essential to salvation through unity with universal cause. Supreme in his contemplative genius, Pythagoras differs from his Eastern mentors in that he conceived the universal state to be attained through elevation of the mind rather than annihilation of thought procedure. As the first step toward realization, he accordingly taught the training of the mind so as to make it capable of sustained logical activity. The misconception is quite general that a common school education equips the mind for the profession of living and, if supplemented by university training the individual is thereby qualified to question and debate intelligently the dictums of eternity. Modem education is not founded upon strict rational procedure, hence the mass of humanity is not educated but rather supports its notions by the vain mumblings of archaic dogma. Unless first subjected to definite disciplines, the mind is incapable of rational functioning. There are few, alas, who, like the young Dalai Lama of Tibet, are able to rise in their cribs on their natal day and recite the sutras in a convincing manner I if a man should approach us and say, I am a human being and a biologist simply because I am a born biologist we would consider him ridiculous. Knowing that many years of definite application must be spent in equipping the reason to cope with the issues of biology. Yet if someone else equally lacking in fitness comes along and says, I am free, white and twenty-one, my thoughts, consequently, are as good and my conclusions concerning life as sound as those of any other man we would smile benignly and exclaim, Ah, vive la democrity! Since few people regard thinking as an exact science, an intellect such as Socrates could in a few moments literally rip to shreds the entire fabric of human notions. To learn to think intelligently requires more time and effort than any other profession known to man and is only to be realized through the most exacting disciplines. Most wordly wise men are in the same position as the young patrician, Alcibiades, who because he wrestled well and played the lyre not too badly considered himself qualified to sit in the Athenian Senate. But all are not fortunate enough to have Socrates, the plebeian, barking at their heels, continually reminding them in no uncertain terms that not on a single count could they qualify. With the same delightful inconsistency characteristic of human procedure, when Socrates revealed to the Athenians their ignorance, they corrected the condition by poisoning the man who had the audacity to confront them with it. Pythagoras invariably demanded of his disciples a familiarity with the principles of three sciences, mathematics, music, and astronomy. These sciences are today capable of filling the same ends which they served in ancient days, for they not only reveal to those familiar with their principles certain cosmic verities, but also instill the principles of order, rationality and comparative values. The curse of the twentieth century is the superficiality of its thought and the resultant insufficiency of the foundation upon which the structure of life is erected. What does it mean to become proficient in mathematics, music and astronomy? Remember, 
We do not refer to the utilitarian aspect of these sciences which too frequently realizes its ideal in the creation of the bookkeeper, the jazz pianist and the elderly prognosticator who determines the annual precipitation from observation of the size of the sunspots. Those who approach life with the oriental attitude, namely, that matter is a vast sea of illusion, may rightly question the advisability of devoting years to the mastery of sciences wholly concerned with the substances of the illusion. Such individuals, however, must learn to regard a certain rational grasp of the tangible as prerequisite to a conception of the intangible. It is not what man actually learns that is of value to him, but rather the mental and spiritual activities within his own nature that necessarily precede and follow learning. Like the carpenter building a chair, the accomplishment is not the production of the chair but the ability to build chairs. Thus, thought in itself should not be regarded as an accomplishment or necessarily valuable, for only the ability to think represents a definite degree of unfoldment within the nature of the thinker himself. When the student realizes that the entire fabric of creation is permeated by certain exact elements and principles, he unconsciously begins to figure and think in terms of exactness. The philosophy of salvation is nothing if not exact. According to both Pythagoras and Plato, mathematics is the father of the sciences, the first and greatest of the mystical disciplines of exactness. Without mathematics as a foundation, nothing can endure, upon its exactitude is raised the entire structure of order and sequence. All other arts and sciences are dependencies of mathematics, for into each enters the element of precision that manifests the unchangeable nature of number. Referring to our fundamental symbolic triad, mathematics is the dot, music the line and astronomy the circle. The mysteries of the invisible causal sphere are to be approached by the principles of mathematics, the mysteries of the intermediate sphere are revealed by the profundities of aesthetics and harmonics, the mysteries of the inferior sphere are disclosed by the study of astronomy. Thus, these sciences are the first triad of knowing and he who masters them is equipped to face the universe with a definite assurance that he is part of a scheme whose principles are inflexible whose agencies are beautiful and whose results are exact. Many people with whom we have discussed these Pythagoric disciplines complain that life is so short and its problems so numerous that time does not permit the mastery of such complicated studies. The inconsistency of such an attitude is primarily one of wrong emphasis. He who does not start because he fears he will not live to finish will never live to start. A certain friend approaching his 80th year is on the verge of commencing the study of Spanish because he feels that it will be an important language during his next incarnation. An individual with such an attitude has surmounted a great obstacle. Too many live in the past and as the years roll by consider the future as an ever-diminishing quantity. The realization of infinite futurity is indispensable to accomplishment but it is useless unless accompanied by a definite impulse to make now the starting point of achievement. Pythagoras was well aware that inconstancy and inconsistency render valueless the greater part of human rumination, hence he regarded the quality of exactness as essential to true mental functioning. He knew that a mind trained to recognize but one right answer to any problem in mathematics would likewise recognize that there is but one right solution to any problem in life. Yet Pythagoras was not fundamentally a mathematician, he was a philosopher, but mathematics was the first and sharpest of his tools. Mathematics is the supreme discipline in the science of knowing. More mystics have come into an understanding of the unseen side of life and realized the unfoldment of their inner perceptions through mathematics than through any other science known to man. Mathematics is the Pythagorean symbol of what the Buddhist terms the law, the procedure of being. Through numbers the intricate mechanism of divine will is disclosed, for nothing else reveals so patently the exactness of cosmic method and the immutability of cosmic ends. 
The vast field of manifestation is shown to be an orderly chain of emanations issuing from the incomprehensibility of first cause and after passing through definite phases of change returning to that from which they were temporarily separated. Through mathematics a hypothetical framework is established by means of which the natures of all manifestations are analyzed and the modes of their directionalization determined. He who understands mathematics can never conceive of himself as existing in an unorganized universe nor regard himself as an exception to the immutable laws of being. Thus, is established the realization of participation in all the activities of cosmos and the glory of the whole is augmented as mathematics unveils the magnificence of the eternal plan. In music the real and the ideal are blended. The mathematical basis upon which the science of harmonics is founded ensures preservation of the principle of exactness. At the same time music stimulates lofty emotional reactions and thus, ameliorates the austerity of numbers. While mathematics emphasizes the exactness of deity, music reveals the moods of the causal nature. Like a flowering vine twining itself about the harsher outlines of mathematical procedure, music softens and beautifies the angles of cosmic discipline. Many dream of the beauty of things as they could be, but only the philosopher can recognize the beauty of things as they are. Two such as are able to lift themselves above the personal concerns of life, the concord of the all is apparent. When Pythagoras taught that men should depend not upon their ears but upon mathematics for the determination of harmony, he emphasized a subtle verity, namely, that the exactness of divine procedure is the absolute standard of harmony, and the order of universal flow is the perfect pattern of all rhythm. These are also the salient points of the philosophy of Taoism and the ascetics of every age have striven to unite their own lesser natures with the harmonic procedures of divinity. Worlds, like atoms, are in a state of ceaseless vibration and this vibration shared by all manifestations is the mysterious dance of life. From the inner nature the study of music causes to issue forth a love for life in all its diversity. While mathematics inspires awe for the immutability of divine jurisprudence, music reveals the all-knowing lawmaker as tempering justice with mercy. Astronomy strangely supplements both mathematics and music and in turn is completed by them. The author of The Merchant of Venice causes one of his players to say, There's not the smallest orb which thou beholds. But in his motion like an angel sings still choiring to the young-eyed cherubism. By the science of astronomy the magnitude of reality is established, for if the unreal stretches from time to timelessness, how much greater must that perfection be of which creation is the inferior past. Gazing out into the infinite from the anthill he calls the earth. Man comes to realize the insignificance of his personality but as the eyes of his inner reason open he beholds the reality within through the transcendency of which he is made to partake of the glory of both the manifested and the unmanifested. In an effort to catch a possible glimpse of any stray gods who might be prowling about the fringe of creation, astronomers are fashioning ever larger and more efficient equipment with which to scan the heavens. A new telescope is now under construction by which stars of the 25th magnitude will be brought within the range of human vision. Thus, of all forms of human learning none possesses the power of astronomy to impress the individual with the realization of cosmic magnitudes. The contribution of astronomy to the attitude of toleration is incalculable, for from the time when Giordano Bruno gave his life that the heavens might be saved for astronomers, the insufficient god of theology was doomed. Equipped with the realization awakened by contemplation of the profundities of mathematics, music and astronomy, the candidate after spiritual understanding may fearlessly knock at the portals of the house of wisdom and demand admission to the hidden house of the mysteries. To those just beginning to awaken to the immensities of life, philosophy is a very hard religion. At first philosophy seems to be faith without sentiment, for it is not concerned with emotion in the ordinary acceptance of the term. 
Having no time for the petty interests which constitute the life of the average individual, philosophy, because of its concern over infinities and ultimates, seems distant and austere. Most individuals live in a universe of trivialities, spending their entire appointed span in the struggle for worthless trinkets. Such naturally desire and create a god concerned with trivialities, for their deity is presumed to be interested in the effect of early frosts upon the crops or the probability of the leghorns escaping the rope. He must also be invoked at conferences and hailed willy-nilly into court to act as sponsor for the integrity of those who testify. On Sunday he is likewise obligated to be in attendance at all the churches, not to mention the Wednesday evening prayer meeting. When philosophy attempts to dissipate this puerile conception of the causal agent, a great hue and cry goes up and those who never had a god other than themselves, cry out, You have destroyed our faith. You have blasphemed our Creator and you strive to take away our God. Asterisk to such mediocre minds philosophy is assuredly a monster who demands a degree of intelligence requisite for attainment which would require time and application far beyond their willingness to sacrifice for such an end. In reality, however, philosophy has a heart greater than all the hearts of the world and it is most loving and most kind because it is most just. Philosophy, like a wise parent, occasionally finds it necessary to chastise its children, not in anger but in the realization that man himself has no enemy like his own uncorrected vice. The truly great philosophers have been men and women whose hearts overflowed with love and understanding, but also, they have been strong, and their strength lay in their recognition of that which was necessary for the good of all. Out of philosophy is born the camaraderie of the spirit. Philosophy does not grind the masses down to a state of bondage in order that it may elevate a few. On the contrary, philosophy is a mental democracy. Thought is not turned to the disqualification of one another, but directed by all to the common end of wisdom. The humanity of today opposes the mind that generalizes, for we live in an age of specialization. The fact that philosophers think in terms of cosmic immensity causes the conservative intellect to view them askance. While minds of small caliber are concerned with the issues of ward politics, the philosopher contemplates that camaraderie which he has discovered among the sparks of infinite being that fill the endless vista of beginnings and ends. The philosopher is a wanderer through the fields of space, to him the earth is a tiny oasis in a vast wilderness. Two or three palm trees, a little fountain and a winding road, these constitute the caravansary where he rests between his daily journeys. To people who are selfish, who seek prestige and demand attention, who are superior to others, who feel that in their veins courses a noble blood, who believe that when God molded them he breathed upon them twice while upon less fortunate mortals he breathed but once, to these and all other varieties of hypocrites philosophy is not pleasing, for it is the creed of honest men and can never come into its own until there are honest men. Philosophy stands for something infinitely superior to physical honesty, something far more difficult of attainment, it stands for mental honesty. It is the fellowship of those who understand, a brotherhood of as many orders as there are degrees of understanding. It is strange that in modern times those who espouse philosophy are prone to grow either unfeeling or eccentric. They are inclined to become mentally lazy. Trusting themselves to the laws of which they have but an insufficient concept, they cease that individual struggle which, after all, is the only measure of true greatness. They have not discovered that while law governs the universe, love is its administrator in the hearts of men. Hence, the knowledge of law is not sufficient. To such knowledge must be added the realization that we are the administrators of that which we know and that within ourselves we have the privilege of tempering the blast of eternal glory so that the shorn lamb may not be destroyed thereby. Observation, discrimination and concentration are prerequisites of knowing. It is first necessary to observe the infinite diversity of phenomenal being, 
then to discriminate between that which is primary in importance and that which is secondary. Having determined that which is most worthy of consideration, it is then necessary to concentrate the attention upon the task of discovering the recondite truths therein contained. When these three faculties are properly combined, they result in a very high degree of rational penetration. Only such individuals as have learned to observe, discriminate and concentrate are qualified to occupy executive positions in any walk of life. If, for example, these faculties had been possessed to even a reasonable degree by the early translators and editors of the Bible, what a different aspect would be taken on by the Scriptures, for instead of words, 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 the spirit of holy writ would have been preserved. In what particular does observation differ from seeing? We prefer to think of observation as the perfection of seeing and the perfection of seeing is not the mere beholding of an object but rather the instant discernment of its inner constitution. Observation is not the mere seeing of things but rather the ability to see through things, making transparent, as it were, their outer nature so that the causal agencies precipitating them may be estimated. Observation, therefore, not only envisages the inherent nature of an object but also its relationship to that which precedes it as cause and follows it as consequence. Readers of the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle are familiar with the fascinating deductions of Sherlock Holmes which he was forced to explain in all their detail to the ever-bewildered Dr. Watson. Into the mouth of Sherlock Holmes his creator puts an excellent description of the powers of observation, for it is true that a man's shoes, the manner in which he holds his hands, his air and carriage all reveal to the trained observer the characteristics of the inner nature which must manifest through these physical peculiarities. The range of human vision is able to take in a comparatively immense area of manifestation and yet comparatively little of that which is seen is recorded in such a way that it can be evoked by the reasoning processes. Only when the consciousness itself is focused upon the organs of sight is their record preserved. We are most likely to behold and preserve the memory of that which is related to some major interest of life. Thus, a plumber will instinctively turn his attention to water pipes, while the artist will scrutinize the lower corner of the canvas for the painter's signature. In great measure, therefore, observation is directionalized by interest, for man sees first that which interests him. Only after ages of mental unfoldment does man learn that in the last analysis all things are of equal interest. Interest is generally unjust in that it focuses the attention upon some fractional part before the panorama of the whole has been taken into consideration. At this point the problem of philosophic indifference should be considered. The philosopher is indifferent not in the sense that he ignores or refuses to concern himself with the diversity of being, but rather that he refuses to become biased by directionalizing his interest primarily upon any single phase of life to the exclusion of the remainder. We study observation first because of its generalizing effect. If particularity precedes generality, the result will be mental intolerance and injustice. If, however, specialization follows generalization, then the mind familiar with all may justly choose one phase of existence and develop it with rationality. But when the individual, having first conceived generality and estimated its profundity, chooses to continue dealing with and thinking in terms of generality, he truly remains a philosopher. In his introduction to an essay on the beautiful by Plotinus, Thomas Taylor writes, but surely the energies of intellect are more worthy our concern than the operation of sense, and the science of universal, permanent and fixed, must be superior to the knowledge of particulars, fleeting and frail. Where is a sensible object to be found which abides for a moment the same, which is not either rising to perfection, or verging to decay, which is not mixed and confused with its contrary? whose flowing nature no resistance can stop, or any art can find. Ascent ascent asterisk since then there is no portion of matter which may not be the subject of experiments without end, 
let us betake ourselves to the regions of mind, where all things are bounded in intellectual measure, where everything is permanent and beautiful, eternal and divine. Let us quit the study of particulars for that which is general and comprehensive and through this learn to see and recognize whatever exists. Observation may be considered as the process of seeing with the mind rather than with the eye. It involves an analysis of the object beheld and the effort to sense or conceive its intrinsic nature. The end of observation is the ability to cognize the life behind the form, the fact behind the fancy, the truth behind the symbol and the self behind the not-self. Through observation one is able to discover wisdom in the words of fools and foolishness in the words of most wise men. Observation, furthermore, is the ability to comprehend the pervading wholeness. He who sex may see the parts, but he who observes closely may glimpse the divine cement that binds the fractions together. We live in a world of men who see in part and are seen in part, who think in part, hope in part, fear in part. The universe is regarded as fragmentary or partitive because we lack the faculty of seeing the wholeness of things. Observation is that transcendent faculty which is able to grasp the wholeness of things in its span of comprehension, whereas ordinary sight is simply the ability to analyze the fragments. Thus, sight differs from observation as widely as analysis differs from synthesis. The inherent danger of observation is that when the man of ordinary vision begins to observe the vastness surrounding him and to realize that even the most minute particle of that vastness is itself immeasurably great, bewilderment ensues. There is an overwhelming sense of inadequacy to cope with the enormousness of the scheme. Then it is that the faculty of discrimination comes to the rescue, emphasizing the fact that if man is not capable of knowing all now, he must compromise by devoting himself to a consideration of only the best. We all realize that in one short span of physical life we cannot do everything, we cannot know everything, we cannot have everything, we cannot be everything, the major part of accomplishment must be left in the keeping of futurity. So, contemplating the heterogeneous mass of phenomena. The rational soul establishes itself upon the surface of phenomena and directs its attention to the specific task of choosing from all that which is next and most necessary to the unfoldment of the faculty of realization. He who possesses discrimination is master of the science of values. Discrimination is the value sense, it is the ability to look upon a number of objects apparently equally important and instantly, instinctively, unerringly recognize that which is chief among them. Recognizing the whole to be of paramount value, it is then necessary to determine the nature of those parts which contribute most to the whole, or that part of the tangible proximate to the intangible. According to the Greek philosophers discrimination is that faculty which organizes things into their value sequence, placing that which is primary first, that which is secondary second and so on ad infinitum. Discrimination is one of the most valued possessions of the inferior man, for it enables him to conserve energy and thus, evade the illusions of time, distance and quality that he himself has established. Discrimination reveals to man that he has what he saves and loses what he wastes in the realm of the physical. By concentrating the energy upon that which is primary and hence superior, discrimination results in the proper conservation of life. The length of life is not to be estimated by the number of years that we plow blindly through the mire of matter. Not time but accomplishment is the true measure of existence. The attainment of true wisdom in all its phases, spiritual, aesthetic and ethical, is the supreme accomplishment. By directionalizing all the energies upon these more important matters, discrimination liberates the mind from the hopeless drudgery of the mediocre. There are three forms of discrimination. The first has for its goal the discovery of that part of visible and sensible things which is primary. It is limited to the form sphere and deals with the problems of multitude and magnitude. For example, in the human body this form of discrimination determines the heart to be the chief part of the body. 
The second form of discrimination is that concerned with the relative integrity or excellence of innate characteristics. It is limited to the comparison of mental and moral excellences. This type of discrimination would elevate the idealist above the realist, the generous above the penurious, the unselfish above the selfish, the beautiful above the so-called practical, for it conceives the greatest good to occupy always the highest place. The third and highest form of discrimination is the power to differentiate between permanence and impermanence, reality and unreality. It is limited to an estimation of the degrees of spiritual permanence. Through this type of discrimination is established the philosophic fact that the spiritual, or invisible man is the real man. Only the one in whom the faculty of discrimination is highly evolved is brave enough to elevate to the position of first importance and greatest solidarity that which to most men is an intangible mystery. Discrimination is essential to success in every department of life, spiritual, mental and physical. Men and women in the physical world must choose means and methods of solving the problems of livelihood and through the use of right discrimination the material activities can be chosen so as to produce definite benefit in the superphysical nature. Discrimination differentiates between people and what they do, between the thinker and his thought, between the spirit and its body, between the innate divinity within and the objective materiality without. Discrimination gradually elevates the consciousness of the individual until it is prone to seek out the good as that which is most worthwhile. The height of discrimination is the recognition of the best. Evil is recognized as the least degree of good, matter, the least degree of spirit, the not-self, which is the personality, the least degree of the real self, which is the principle. Discrimination has for its archenemy human selfishness. Because of its innate dishonesty, humanity deprives itself of the right to know good and evil. Justice is symbolized as blindfolded so that its personal attitudes may not influence its decisions. If discrimination is to be of value, it must also be applied with a strictly impersonal attitude, for the instant the mind is personally involved in its problem, the sense of true perspective and relationship is lost. Most people sit in one end of the scales when they weigh a problem. We are prone to live not according to our knowledge of right and wrong but according to our prejudices and whims. Things have an unpleasant way of looking not as they actually are but as we want them to, all because we cannot divorce the personal equation from our problem. Thus, we make the decision fit our own desire and try to resolve the universe into a facsimile of our own notions. Many people who would scorn to be dishonest in the physical sense are dishonest mentally. The one who possesses true discrimination realizes only too well that he can never be just while he is personally involved in the question on which he must pass judgment. A slight digression may not be out of order for the purpose of considering two terms which modern psychology has popularized, namely, the inferiority and superiority complexes. In reality, these two types are each twofold in character. The inferiority-inferiority complex is that mental attitude which causes the individual to picture himself as a groveling, squirming worm of the dust, predestined to be blind, to live in darkness and eternally to be trodden underfoot. This attitude paralyzes initiative and is a never-ending blasphemy against the divinity innate in every creature. The inferiority-superiority complex is the index of the hopeless egotist. Its victims have full confidence in their own integrity and excellence and in every act evince the realization of their self-importance. They make themselves heartily obnoxious, however, by assuming airs of modesty and inferiority in order to adduce evidence that they are not what they know they are. They have heard that great people are invariably distinguished by their modesty, hence their assumption of the virtue. The superiority-superiority complex manifests itself as boundless self-assurance. Such an individual, like the character of the story book, can achieve the impossible, do the undoable and unscrew the inscrutable. 
The Pages of History team with the exploits of these colossal egotists who, however, backed their egotism up with achievement. Such achievements, though, are almost invariably of a temporal nature. Several philosophers also exhibited this moral obliquity, but are remembered chiefly for more worthy accomplishments. The superiority-inferiority complex is usually borne by an individual who is an inveterate but unconscious liar. Such a person gives an external exhibition of consummate nerve while internally recognizing himself unable to cope with the situation. In other words, he is the high-pressure bluffer, the personality plus product of modern pseudo-psychology. If it were possible for such a person to be honest with himself but for a single instant, his courage would ooze out like a cold sweat and leave him a moral bankrupt. Discrimination is not only the ability to choose wisely from the mass of mental and physical phenomena around us, but is also the ability to analyze the elements of our own thinking, feeling, and acting for the purpose of unfolding that which is good and eliminating that which is unnecessary. A very good way to approach this particular problem is to make an inventory of our assets and liabilities, mental, emotional, and physical. While so engaged we might choose as our motto, what is man that the Lord should be mindful of him? What do we know that our opinions should be of vast pith and moment? By what right do we sit in judgment upon the world and its maker? During such self-examination we are lost without honesty or, more correctly, integrity. It is well that we differentiate between honesty and integrity. Honesty gives sixteen ounces to the pound because of law, while integrity gives sixteen ounces to the pound because sixteen ounces make a pound. Having decided to judge yourself with absolute integrity, make a list of the virtues you possess, together with the degree of their opposites which manifest in your nature. If you are kind, to what degree are you unkind? If you are generous, to what degree are you penurious? If you are just, to what degree are you unjust? Perfections are determined by the degree of imperfections. Thus, truthfulness is determined by the degree of untruthfulness. This is doubtless the reason one is so prone to see faults in others, for faults are the basis upon which the degree of faultlessness is to be estimated. Possibly for the same reason few people are congratulated for their virtues with either the fervor or the frequency that they are criticized for their vices. Having arrived at a reasonable estimate of the proportions of ignorance intervening between your present state and the desired state, next list the arts, sciences and crafts with whose principles you have some degree of familiarity. Then ask yourself what is the percentage of your understanding of them as compared to that which is knowable concerning them. Discrimination will assist you to judge accurately the relation occupied by what you know to that which can be known. It logically follows also that your capacity to understand is measured by that which you understand and by the understanding with which you understand you are most likely to be understood. Since it reveals man's incompleteness, discrimination is therefore, a continual urge toward completion. Man is not perfect until he knows all and is united in consciousness with all. Until this state is reached there can be no cessation of activity without disaster. We all have mental faculties that are weak, sense perceptions uncertain in the quality of their acuteness. Discrimination assists us to develop rationality by balancing the faculties until all the parts involved in the process of knowing are equilibrated. The result is a balanced and rational attitude toward the various conditions of life. Discrimination inspires tolerance in that it reveals the relationship which man as a spiritual condition bears to the body which he occupies. Discrimination proves that while the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Criticism should therefore, be directed against these inconsistencies existing in the relationship of the parts. In this way the sting of personality is removed. The spirit of man is ever composing beautiful melodies, but by the time they reach physical expression they are mostly reduced to discords. 
Such was the dilemma of the young man learning to play the cornet, who, turning to his teacher, exclaimed, Why is it that when I blow the music in it is so sweet, but when it comes out it is so sour? Discrimination helps man to recognize the melodies of the spirit and ignore the inharmonies of the flesh. Hence, discrimination is a forgiving faculty, not in the general acceptation of the word but in the sense of understanding, for the moment we fully understand people we have forgiven them. Spirit is intrinsically beautiful and those who raise their consciousness to the recognition of universal life dwell in the sense of beauty. Discrimination reveals the beautiful in that it chooses to gaze upon the face of reality and to ignore the seething ocean of illusion. The realization of self is synonymous with the recognition of divinity and he who beholds with his inner perception the radiant face of the one has reached the vanishing point of enmity and animosity. Discrimination also dispels the illusion of relationships. Relationship is a man-made concept of proximities. It is an effort to give expression to the interval, mental or physical, by which things are separated, for relationship is not estimated by the proximity of one part to another but rather by the distance one part is away from another. Through believing that by the concept of relationship he unites life, man's efforts in this respect all too often contain only the sense of increasing separateness, for when we take that which is already synonymous with ourselves and relate it to ourselves we are really dividing it from ourselves. Discrimination finally reveals to us that relationships are illusions of the mortal mind and that since all things are one in essence they are consequently indivisible and incapable of existing in any relationship of proximity one to the other. Even the ideal of friendship, though the loftiest of man's illusional attitudes, is thus, revealed as insufficient. But even as wisdom is merely the vanishing point of ignorance, so illusion exists in a state of orderly concatenation, with friendship as the last and consequently the least degree of the illusion of relationship. Having through discrimination attained to a state of right mindfulness, it is necessary to maintain such state and project it to perfection through the aid of concentration. Having discovered the purpose of life through observation and discrimination, man consummates that purpose through concentration of his faculties upon that single end. To concentrate means simply to focalize all the energies upon an appointed task. The mental activities of most people are scattered like spray when they are confronted by the solid wall of that which is to be known. Individuals read books while their minds are concerned with other interests. When the intellect is laden with responsibilities which it cannot cast off, it ceases to function with the acuteness necessary for philosophic perception. The true thinker realizes that his mind is capable of fatigue and while this fatigue may not be apparent in the grosser activities it precludes the possibility of exactness in fine thinking. The normal mind works on the union basis of an eight-hour day with time and a half of for over time, for every period of intense effort the mind must be compensated by a similar period of relaxation. The immature intellect of the average person must work slowly and orderly if it is to accomplish, for only a genius such as Julius Caesar can do a dozen things at once with any degree of success. It may truthfully be said that half an hour of profound mental activity is a day's work for the mind and he who accomplishes this is entitled to be termed industrious in things of the intellect. We presume ourselves to be mentally active during the entire period of wakefulness, but in reality we wander in a sort of mental delirium in which the elements of conception and reflection tumble over each other in hopeless disorder. Only when confronted by some actual crisis does the mind rise to organized activity and after the crisis is past the resultant mental exhaustion is far greater than the average person realizes. About 15 minutes of unremitting mental concentration will exhaust the ordinary man. Only by special training can the intellectual faculties be elevated to the stage of prolonged, orderly functioning as exercise scientifically chosen will strengthen an otherwise deficient physical member, so definite and proper mental exercise will increase mental capacity. 
In the field of mental culture the Greeks enjoyed a supremacy never approached by any other race. They built gymnasiums not only for the culture of the body but also for the mind, the result being their overwhelming superiority in the realm of creative thought. In its philosophic aspect concentration implies that all the life activities are centered upon the noblest goal and held in this state of fixation until the goal is achieved. Consecration of life to definite purpose is indispensable to accomplishment. Philosophy assures its disciples that when man, through discrimination, has discovered the desired end and is willing to sacrifice every other interest to the attainment of that end, he will ultimately arrive at indissoluble union with the object of his desire. This is, of course, a superphysical truth. If a man devotes a lifetime of effort to amassing a million dollars, he will not ultimately take upon himself the actual appearance of money. He will, however, gradually deteriorate until his life is susceptible of complete expression in terms of money. Through concentration the life energies are coordinated upon the path of achievement and success is in direct proportion to the power or degree of concentration. As the sun's rays concentrated by a burning glass are able to generate a high degree of heat, so man's mental and physical energies when properly focused give expression to potencies never dreamed of. In order to find the solitude considered essential to concentration, the hermits of old retired from the world of men and immured themselves in the depth of the forest or in caves high upon the mountainside. Surrounded by the tranquility of nature they dreamed their lives away, finding in their solitary retirement a certain measure of peace. Of course, such an environment made the act of concentration comparatively easy, but for the same reason also made its efficacy less potent. By thus, isolating himself from the social body, though never able to sever the physical bonds which still related him to it the ascetic sought to approach divinity by retiring from a world which he mistakenly assumed to be the antipode of deity. Having through discrimination attained to a state of right mindfulness, it is necessary to maintain such state and project it to perfection through the aid of concentration. Having discovered the purpose of life through observation and discrimination, man consummates that purpose through concentration of his faculties upon that single end. To concentrate means simply to focalize all the energies upon an appointed task. The mental activities of most people are scattered like spray when they are confronted by the solid wall of that which is to be known. Individuals read books while their minds are concerned with other interests. When the intellect is laden with responsibilities which it cannot cast off, it ceases to function with the acuteness necessary for philosophic perception. The true thinker realizes that his mind is capable of fatigue and while this fatigue may not be apparent in the grosser activities it precludes the possibility of exactness in fine thinking. The normal mind works on the union basis of an eight-hour day with time and a half off for overtime. For every period of intense effort the mind must be compensated by a similar period of relaxation. The immature intellect of the average person must work slowly and orderly if it is to accomplish, for only a genius such as Julius Caesar can do a dozen things at once with any degree of success. It may truthfully be said that half an hour of profound mental activity is a day's work for the mind and he who accomplishes this is entitled to be termed industrious in things of the intellect. We presume ourselves to be mentally active during the entire period of wakefulness, but in reality we wander in a sort of mental delirium in which the elements of conception and reflection tumble over each other in hopeless disorder. Only when confronted by some actual crisis does the mind rise to organized activity and after the crisis is passed the resultant mental exhaustion is far greater than the average person realizes. About 15 minutes of unremitting mental concentration will exhaust the ordinary man. Only by special training can the intellectual faculties be elevated to the stage of prolonged, orderly functioning. As exercise scientifically chosen will strengthen an otherwise deficient physical member, so definite and proper mental exercise will increase mental capacity. 
In the field of mental culture the Greeks enjoyed a supremacy never approached by any other race. They built gymnasiums not only for the culture of the body but also for the mind, the result being their overwhelming superiority in the realm of creative thought. In its philosophic aspect concentration implies that all the life activities are centered upon the noblest goal and held in this state of fixation until the goal is achieved. Consecration of life to definite purpose is indispensable to accomplishment. Philosophy assures its disciples that when man, through discrimination, has discovered the desired end and is willing to sacrifice every other interest to the attainment of that end, he will ultimately arrive at indissoluble union with the object of his desire. This is, of course, a superphysical truth. If a man devotes a lifetime of effort to amassing a million dollars, he will not ultimately take upon himself the actual appearance of money. He will, however, gradually deteriorate until his life is susceptible of complete expression in terms of money. Through concentration the life energies are coordinated upon the path of achievement and success is in direct proportion to the power or degree of concentration. As the sun's rays concentrated by a burning glass are able to generate a high degree of heat, so man's mental and physical energies when properly focused give expression to potencies never dreamed of. In order to find the solitude considered essential to concentration, the hermits of old retired from the world of men and immured themselves in the depth of the forest or in caves high upon the mountainside. Surrounded by the tranquility of nature they dreamed their lives away, finding in their solitary retirement a certain measure of peace. Of course, such an environment made the act of concentration comparatively easy, but for the same reason also made its efficacy less potent. By thus, isolating himself from the social body, though never able to sever the physical bonds which still related him to it, the ascetic sought to approach divinity by retiring from a world which he mistakenly assumed to be the antipode of deity. He overlooked the obvious fact that he who finds a not God among men will find him nowhere else. Rabindranath Tagore once expressed his aversion for the life of the ascetic by declaring that without love and companionship the path of perfection was not worth walking at all. Concentration is not necessarily promoted by isolation, in fact, the acid test of concentration is to be found in the environment of confusion. If the mind can be deflected from its goal by the phantasm of surroundings, it is incapable of concentration, for when concentration is perfected all the faculties are united in the performance of a definite task and no sense perceptions are left unoccupied with which to register external impressions. While concentration seems a Herculean effort to the mind that has not learned to coordinate its own parts, it is accomplished without effort by the trained thinker, in fact, many possess the faculty without the slightest knowledge of its existence. The musician lost in some rhapsody, the artist spellbound before his unfolding creation, the philosopher oblivious to the world as he ponders the immensity of space, the tragedian buried in his part, the financier frenziedly watching the blackboard of the stock exchange all these not only exemplify the power of concentration but also its application to various ends, worthy or unworthy, according to die clarity of discrimination present. Regardless, however, of the factor of worthiness, wherever we find true concentration we find excellence. The faculty of concentration also manifests through continuity, the least developed faculty of the American people. Continuity means the sequential unfoldment of a project from germinal beginning to final consummation, or the resolution not to relinquish the task until it is completed. This faculty is frequently lacking in children and seriously interferes with their efficiency in later life. When work seems arduous we quickly tire of it, or because we are not sure whether we really want the thing for which we strive we soon doubt our desire to gain it. When we are certain of our own minds and carry labor to its legitimate end, our undertaking will be crowned with success. We are then confronted with the problem of whether the finished product is an aid or a hindrance to us in our quest for reality. 
We should never concentrate upon any desired end until discrimination has revealed it to be the supreme ideal, for the universe avenges itself for the misuse of its agencies by forcing us to abide by our own decisions. The ultimate ideal of concentration is attained when all the external parts are turned inward toward the contemplation of self. When all the forces of the outer nature are thus, united, then is generated the strength with which to achieve perfection. The diagram at the beginning of this chapter sets forth in the figurative terms of Platonism the relationship of the elements under discussion the threefold divinity the one, the beautiful and the good manifests out of itself an inconceivable number of secondary triads. The secondary triad pertaining to absolute knowledge is composed of the rational principles now incorporated in the all too inadequate vehicles of philosophy, religion and science. Thus, it is demonstrated that philosophy partakes of the indivisible nature of the one and hence serves as the reconciling, unifying agent, being symbolic of the point of absolute intellectual convergence. Theology likewise reflects to an imperfect degree the nature of the beautiful, a postulate substantiated by the emphasis placed upon the fine arts by nearly all religious systems. Science, in turn, imperfectly manifests the nature of the good and those who minister at its altars lay special stress upon utilitarianism. Descending to the level of method we find a new triad established, namely, discrimination, concentration and observation. Discrimination may be conceived to be the goal of philosophy, concentration the goal of theology and observation the goal of science. On the mental plane these three may also be considered as indispensable factors in the acquisition of knowledge. Observation is the sharpest tool of science. Concentration is essential to the esoteric doctrines of theology, discrimination is the secret of philosophic insight. In the world of physical arts and sciences, the one becomes mathematics, the first and most exact of all the sciences, which partakes of the powers of the one through the succession of philosophy and discrimination. The beautiful becomes music, which partakes of the primal beauty through the succession of theology and concentration. The good becomes astronomy, which partakes of the original good through the succession of science and observation. Thus, is demonstrated the soundness of the ancient Pythagorean doctrine that the establishment and relationship of triads is the true basis of philosophic procedure. If the diagram be considered from the standpoint of the Socratic school, we have an invaluable key to the unfoldment of the inner nature. Socrates affirmed the possibility of stimulating the superphysical nature by familiarizing the objective nature with those tangible arts and sciences that had their correspondences in the superphysical. For example, the study of astronomy increased the power of observation. Through its development observation in turn produced the scientist and the scientist plying his scientific pursuits ultimately achieved to a knowledge of the good. Thus, unfoldment of the inferior stimulated unfoldment of its analogy in the superior and step by step in such indirect fashion the highest was ultimately attained. A question frequently asked by metaphysical students is how it is possible to stimulate the spiritual nature and herein will be found the answer. Each part of the objective nature manifests some potentiality of the subjective life principle. The refinement and perfection of any part of the objective nature is a direct stimulus to its correspondence in the causal nature from which it was originally objectified. Thus, the physical activity of thinking, when properly directionalized, develops the entire mental nature or body. Similarly, the proper directionalization of physical emotion results in the unfoldment of the emotional body which, being invisible and intangible, can only be contacted through its pole in the outer nature. Eventually man will be able to definitely relate all his physical parts and members with their incorporeal causal agencies. He can then it will stimulate his superphysical organisms through right directionalization of their corresponding physical organisms. The purpose of this chapter is to give a brief outline of what constitutes a rational beginning of the philosophic life. 
He who would achieve to the highest must realize that without the systematic culture of the entire organism, even a relative degree of perfection is unattainable. The general metaphysical practice of platitudes, affirmations and denials is unsound in theory and barren of results, for the organization of the life is only possible through certain definite, exact and unchanging disciplines that have been preserved to the present generation as the priceless heritage of antiquity. Many people possess to varying degrees so-called psychic powers. Such powers may be considered as natural to them, in other words, they have not been acquired by any definite effort. But regardless of how remarkable these natural endowments may seem to both their possessor and the world at large, they are a liability rather than an asset unless they are reduced to order through philosophic discipline. Nearly all so-called natural mystics have missed the goal for which they strove because they were satisfied to accept intangibles and indefinite attitudes as the lodestar of life. With few exceptions such natural psychics conceive themselves to be very highly evolved souls, unmindful of the fact that the lowliest canine possesses psychic powers far exceeding their own but incapable of rationally directing its powers the animal must live and move and have its being in bondage to man. The psychic who has not through rational discipline become master of these psychic endowments is in no way superior spiritually to the brute and will ultimately suffer some brutish end for his irrationality. The fond illusion that perfection comes naturally to such people must go if true consciousness is to be attained. Herein is revealed the mystery of the universal soul and the redemption of none through the doctrine of grace. When atonement is understood in its platonic interpretation as an atonement, or reconciliation of the not-self and the self through the disciplines of philosophy, we come to sense the magnitude of spiritual redemption. Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.